Coming to you from a portable microphone, this is Don't Get Me Started. This is a conversation about advertising. And here is your host, freelance creative director and creative circus department head, Dan Balser. Yes, welcome back to another episode of the podcast. I am your host, Dan Balser. And before we get to the conversation with Pete and Wally, um, I'm, I never do this. I never, I don't think, long, long-time listeners, you can call me on, call me out on this, but I don't think I've ever referenced other episodes directly in sequence like I'm about to do. But the last episode that came out, which was the Atlanta United Mega Special, it was originally called that. You may realize there were two versions of that show. There was one that included a conversation with the club's ad agency, and there's one that doesn't. So without getting into any detail, because it's not relevant, I just want you guys, if you're younger, to realize that the hassles and frustrations that you deal with with your creative directors and partners and clients, those those hassles never go away. It doesn't matter how long you're in a creative field or you're making content, the hassles and challenges never go away. There's always something that can go wrong, and they just kind of evolve or they just kind of morph, um, but they're sort of ubiquitous. It's just part of the deal when you're doing things that are new. And I still think of this podcast as an experiment and a work in progress. And that's just how it goes. So there was one part of the version of the episode that's up now, the last one, the Atlanta United one, that got cut in the second part. And that was a little bit where I talked about, I had asked for questions from friends and ad folk and soccer fans to ask the Atlanta United marketing team. And one of the comments came back and said, "Um, I got nothing. I hate advertising. And it was pretty funny. It made me laugh. And it started, it started getting me thinking a little bit that advertising at its worst is a video that you have to sit through before you get to watch the video that you want to sit through. But advertising at its best can really infuse a sense of loyalty and love for brands and even soccer teams. So that got me that got me sort of thinking a little bit about how we structured this and where does creative fit in. And This podcast has always been very much focused on the creative part of it, right? But an agency can't thrive on great ideas alone, and great ideas alone don't always survive or see the light of day because there are so many other components involved, which brings me to my conversation with Pete and Wally. Pete is currently Executive Vice President and Chief Operating Officer at RPA. He's been at RPA for 24 years. Prior to that, for seven years, he was in account management at Saatchi and Saatchi. He has a degree in political science and English from UCLA, and he has helped build RPA to an agency that now handles work that you've probably seen for Honda, Apartments.com, Farmers Insurance, lots of really smart, fun work on multiple Super Bowls. You should check out their website, RPA.com. The RPA website says, and I'm quoting, We are hundreds of creative minds collaborating together in sunny Santa Monica, California, where we've been based and independently led and owned for 30 years. We're driven by a mission to create ideas and experience that put people first within a culture that values our own people and empowers them to create best-in-class work. It's a unique culture that nurtures enduring relationships with our people and our client partners. So this conversation took place over the phone and Before we get to the conversation, make sure you like the Facebook page for the show. That's facebook.com slash DGMS podcast. Now, here's my conversation with Pete M. Wally, COO of RPA. So, all right, let's start off first of all. Okay, so a lot of the listeners are on the creative side. Um, Some are maybe young account guys or planners. What does it mean to be a COO? What is a chief operating officer's uh, job? And who... And this is maybe a completely secondary question. To whom do you feel that you answer? Um, talk a little bit about your, your day-to-day job and who you feel like um, is your – who do you answer to? 
So I, I report directly to our uh, two principal owners, our CEO and our CFO, Bill Hagelstein and Vince Mancuso. But I think who I answer to and who I'm responsible to at RPA, we believe very much in this idea of servant leadership. And it's a very just upside down pyramid model. And what that gets to is that my job every day is to figure out how I can help facilitate the work that the people who report to me are doing. There's a ton of work going on in lots of different departments in this agency and I think my primary responsibility is to give them the tools and the people and the space to do what they need to do so that we can be successful in satisfying our clients. Well, what does that mean? Does that mean like um, giving them – you know? supporting the the work does it mean communicating what the client's desires are when you say like creating the space for them to succeed what do you what do you mean exactly how does that well i think it's look i, I think it means all of those things so i think the primary responsibility for me it, operationally i think my role is very simple and and pragmatic i have to make sure we have enough office space that we have enough computers mm-hmm. that we have enough uh, people to physically get the work done but then it it also comes down to Everybody who works in an agency, especially a full-service agency, is all trying to succeed at whatever it is they do. Part of my role is to help them succeed across disciplines and across projects from from different yardsticks. One of the things that we come across in this business all the time is that the creative department is measured on one yardstick, the media department on another, and the account group Mm -hmm. and the strategic planning group on a completely different one. And sometimes when people are arguing, it's not because they're not looking out for what's best. It's because they're looking out what's best for their part of the equation. And I think a lot of what my role is is to help people find the common ground and to help them find the solution that is the best for the client uh, even when it might not be the best solution for their particular discipline. And often it is though, right? I mean often it can be. They're not necessarily mutually exclusive, right? Sure. The the absolute best is when you hit a creative home run that also drives business success and is a, is an award winning concept that's never been done before. Yeah, but awesome. the the challenge is when somebody has an uh, award winning idea for something that's never been done before, but you have a pretty good idea, it's not really going to solve the client's business challenge. Right. How do we make it solve the business challenge? How do we help the creative people see that even though this is a great idea, it's not the right solution for this particular business challenge? All right. So that's what you enjoy. You enjoy um, being that that sort of glue or catalyst. Is that is that is that the thing that has kept you going? Yeah, I'm I'm a facilitator in uh, in probably every sense of the world. I I think I'm an enabler, hopefully in a good way. Um, when people run across roadblocks, I want to be there to help them get by them or to help them understand why that roadblock maybe was thrown up. Interesting. Um, so here's a, here's another uh, sort of – maybe this is related, maybe not. But so you've been at RPA, by my math, something like 24 years? Yes, 24 years this year. That's unreal. So how, how do you manage to keep it um, feeding your sort of psyche and your energy because you're clearly – still enthusiastic about it and dedicated to it. What is it that about that place or you that has really helped you make it that long at one agency? Well, I think I mean, first off, I've had a lot of different jobs even though I've been here for a mm-hmm. long time. I started out in traditional uh, account management. I, I came from seven years at Saatchi before I started here. And then I came here in 1993 just as we were starting to get into digital forms of advertising. One of the first projects I worked on was a launch for Honda that we put a product on the Prodigy network. Uh, And as you're probably aware, Prodigy, AOL, and CompuServe were these three online services that preceded the World Wide Web. They were online services on the internet backbone before the graphical user face for the World Wide Web had been invented and, and rolled out a year or two later in 94 and 95. So yep. Yep. Um, I started out in traditional, got into digital stuff very early on. In 1995, we became uh, one of the first agencies in the world to have a website. And then we made Honda the first car company to have a website. And mm-hmm. by 1997, I was working full time on the digital side. So I really got to work in something that was new and changing and evolving and very entrepreneurial. 
And I loved that. You know, the, the idea of helping to build what the business model would be for digital in an agency or in marketing services was new every single day. And I think it gave me a great opportunity to learn how to supervise and manage people that weren't just account people, technology That's people, cool. user experience, creative, media. And that brought a lot of diversity and a lot of interesting things to my day. But I think the other reason I've been able to stay here for all that time is this really is a place where it's privately owned. The owners have a very, very um, people-friendly sort of attitude. I think I am not uncommon at all among our senior management team. Everybody's been here 20 years. And I think mm -hmm. uh, the reason for that is many of us have worked in holding company agencies or bigger places that had more bureaucracy and more, you got to call London or New York or France or Chicago to get an approval. And it's so empowering and refreshing to have the approval be somebody who you sit next to yeah. or for you to be the approval. Uh, and not to have to worry about re reporting that and explaining it to stockholders every quarter. That's really cool. Yeah, I was going to actually ask you the benefit of working at an independent agency is that you don't have to report to stockholders. You don't have to call another agency, another office in somewhere else in the world to get approval. Is there anything else about the independent agency experience that is that's been valuable? Well, I think for me, the primary value of the independent experience has been just that. You know the. The ability to chart your own course and to figure out where you want to go. Part of the reason that we were so successful early on in digital is that a few of us were able to convince Jerry Rubin and Larry Poster, our founders, that digital would one day be an important part of our clients' marketing spend. And we didn't have to create a huge business case to get them to say, sure, go hire a couple people. We literally had a conversation around a conference table and a couple months later, we were setting up a digital practice and it wasn't having to go set up a business plan and, and market it to 15 different groups and gain consensus of all, of all these different people. And if it didn't pay off right away, you shut it down. Uh, it yeah. also allowed us to build it organically and not to wait until it was financially uh, an easy move and then go purchase other people and try to integrate them. So mm – -hmm. Having that ability to just, if it makes sense and we can afford it, we'll do it, allows you to be much more nimble and not having to figure out how I can show that this first quarter it was profitable or the second quarter it was more profitable than that and the third quarter right. it was even more profitable because if you don't beat expectations for the stock market, then you're failing. And I think right. that here we want to be profitable and we want to make money like any other company but we – we don't have so much writing on what we report. So uh, that pressure to have to report a number and the other thing is the, the challenge with a holding company is if you think about it, that you – every agency our size, we're, we're going to be over 700 people by the beginning of April and every agency our size that's a part of a holding company has to take a large percentage of their income and send it to the holding company. That's how the stockholders make money. That's how you pay for the overhead and the infrastructure. There's right. a lot of services and a lot of resources that come with that expense, but it's a great expense. And the agency business is so much leaner than it used to be. And all business is leaner than it used to be. I think everybody tends to think, well, I'm a production company and my business is harder than it used to be. Well, so is the agency, the editor, and the clients that support them. We all have right. more competitors and slimmer margins. So we've got to figure out how to be successful with a slimmer margin. And having to take a big part of that margin and ship it off to somebody else is a is a, is a real challenge. I, I, yeah. I love the fact that that's not something I have to deal with. Yeah, it's a tough pill to swallow. Um, so sort of a variation of the question, like what's, what would be the benefit? Maybe this is, you have to figure this, extrapolate this one, but what would be the benefit for a young creative or a young account person for working at an independent agency? Is there, is there, if, if it's down to me taking a job, an independent agency versus a big network, what's the benefit for a young person? Because a big network's going to say, we have all these resources and we could move you and all those kind of things. What would the, what, what would the benefit be for a, for a, a junior? Yeah, I think – and frankly, those are great benefits. I think the idea that there's lots of different options and lots of different places to go and they can move you to other offices or other countries is a very interesting premise and it's one of the things that we 
can't necessarily offer people in that way. What we can offer people is a much more personal approach to their career. You know that you will have a boss that you report to that actually has accountability for how much you get paid and what your next promotion is. That you don't have to wait for uh, the financial situation in another country to improve before you can right. get a raise. Right. And I think that. When, when I was at Saatchi, and this was back well before the Publicist days, it was, uh, it was when Saatchi was the holding company, I remember having to lay off interns that were making no money on the Toyota business because they had lost British Airways or Mars or something in right. London. And right. wow. m- money was tough in the network. So I was on the largest, fastest growing account in the entire Saatchi empire and we were laying off people that were making $10 an hour. It just didn't make sense to me. Right, right. Um, okay, so speaking of uh, creatives, so what do you look for in a in a creative partner? As a guy who's running the the business from the account side, dealing with clients, what's important? What do you look for in creative directors and in the young creatives that are coming in uh, to make the sort of relationship work day to day to get the best work? So that's a great question. There's lots of things that I look for in creative directors especially to work with that will make it easier for me as a businessman or as an account lead. But there is no substitute for great ideas. So first and foremost, you have to have people who are just plain creative, who are coming up with new, clever, different ways to solve client problems. Uh, people that can routinely look at things and have a different point of view and a different perspective and make people look at something a different way. And that, that is an ability that you don't find in, in most people. That's what makes great creatives so special. So mm-hmm. we're always looking for true innovation and real creativity. But I think more than ever in this industry, what we really need are people who are both curious and collaborative. And the reason I say that is I grew up in the era of, you know, the mid 80s to mid 90s where there were rock star creative teams. You know, the, the, the guys who created a, a spot for the Super Bowl and they did the print and the outdoor and a cool radio campaign that went with it. And they might have had a couple juniors helping them, but they did the whole campaign themselves. And I think today you can see it just from going to an award show or reading the credits at the end of a spot on you know creative creativity pick of the day. There are a hundred creative names on there, and the reason is because now we have people doing every different form of digital channel. We have still traditional video and broadcast. We have lots of different other ways to do experiential and print. All those additional pieces need people to do them. And if you have a creative team that wants to do everything themselves, you are going to limit the ability for that campaign to be big and be great. So for me, I look for creative people who welcome the ideas that other people bring to their campaign instead of creative people who just want to defend the perfection of the original idea. Right, right, right. That's very interesting because now it's like sort of about you have to create a uh – almost a DNA or a germ that can be developed um, across all sorts of different media that may or may not be the original team's responsibility. That's really interesting. So yeah, you I'm said a, that – you mentioned the creativity online and pick of the day. You re, you look at creativity online? Oh, I look at all of that stuff. I think um, – you know, I think it's hard to be in this business and not care about creative. Uh, <laughs> if, if you think about I, – I went to UCLA and I studied English and political science and – my family were farmers and lawyers and I uh, had been a farmer so I had to be a lawyer and <laughs> I I realized the closer I got to graduating that I didn't want to be a lawyer because the farmers in my family were actually happier than the lawyers in my family. Oh, that's and interesting. I started deciding that I needed to come up with a new career path besides the two that my family had uh, primarily used and I actually talked to a career counselor in UCLA and said, um, you know, She started asking me what I liked and what I didn't like and said, you know, have you ever thought about a job in entertainment? And I said, yeah, I like entertainment, but I just don't know if I'm fickle enough for the business and the way that it goes up and down and and all the drama and everything else. She said, well, have you ever thought about advertising? Because advertising and marketing has that sense of creativity, but there's also so business and, and a little more discipline to it. And 
you know, I took a class at the Ad Center, which at that time was a, sort of an offshoot of uh, Ad Week. And mm. it was sort of a bookshop, but they also did classes for aspiring account people and other things. And I took a class at the Ad Center and uh, ended up getting hired by my instructor to go work at Saatchi. And that's how I got into this business. And that is really there, interesting. There's no way I would have gotten into it if not for the fact that I love the creative part of it. Yeah, that is really, really cool. And advertising is like is like the um, entertainment industry except for <laughs> you can have a career instead of working on projects for your whole career. Uh, yeah. You can build something. You can work somewhere and build something. Um, so – Talking a little bit more about the the you know the, the type of people that you like to work with, you'd mentioned before we started recording this idea about you know everybody caring about creative. Talk to me a little bit about and you just mentioned that that you how can you be in this business if you don't care about creative? Talk to me about what's important in in the people in your department in the in the uh, account management and people that run the business. Well, I think there's a couple of things. First off, um, you do need people that appreciate good creative because I think. Among strategic planners and account managers and even media people, everybody gets excited when there's great creative. And the best possible work that the agency can do is when you find that creative that is truly inspiring, that breaks through the clutter, that changes people's perception, that moves them to act, but it also achieves a business goal. You know, my, my favorite work is the work that wins an Effie and a Can Lion. And I think that work that just does one or the other is not as great as something that can win both. And the reason for that is we are in the business of helping clients market and sell and improve their business position. So if our work's not doing that, then we're failing. But that being said, we all got into this because being in a creative business was a lot more fun than selling insurance or working for a drug company. And I I think we all get inspired. We all love watching Super Bowl Sunday and seeing what this industry comes up with. We all love when the spot that I had nothing to do with creatively comes up at the top of the ad meter or when people are tweeting like crazy how much they love the concept. I take great pride in that. I didn't do it. But I worked with people who did. I helped bring them here. I helped keep them here. And I helped get clients to appreciate that work. And that's the value I bring to it. And I think that one of the things I love, Joe Joe Baratelli is our chief creative officer and he and I have worked together for the entire time I've been here. And Joe is an extremely collaborative person. He's also a person that is very quick to credit the person in digital strategy who came up with the insight that allowed us to do some award-winning social program. And what that does is it makes everybody feel so invested and so supportive. And and I always say as a manager or a leader, you can rule with authority because you have a title, but respect is earned, not granted. People need to want to work with you. And if they want to work with you, they're going to work much harder than if they have to work with you. Ooh, that's good. I hope people are listening to that. That's really great. Well, full disclosure, you know, Alicia Dotter, I think worked on their most recent, um, Honda Super Bowl spot, and I'm so pr- I was so proud to have been a teacher or at least know her. So I mean I know what you mean when you're like sort of involved with something. It gives just su- such great pride, even if you weren't the one that came up with the idea. I think that says a lot about you as a, as a leader too. So have you ever seen an idea that was so great? How often has this happened? Oh my God, that's just genius! I love that. It's completely off strategy. There's no way we can sell it. <laughs> so what do you do? Does that happen? And what do you do in that in that case? I think it does happen. Um, I think more often than not, you, your first attempt is to say, well, how do we make this on strategy? Is mm-hmm. there a way that we can fundamentally change it? And as I talked about before, a creative team that is open to the idea that other people can make their idea better instead of – and need to protect the purity of the original concept. You know, the, I, the one – thing that I cannot stand hearing from creative people is the idea of, well, that's not being true to the concept because that's not being true to the concept basically says you're offering up something that wasn't part of my original idea. Right. And you're right. right. That is exactly what I'm doing. I'm trying to make your idea either more successful or more likely to be sold and produced. So you should welcome in that kind of comment. You should welcome in the person who knows about – yeah, that's really, really hard because you have to now – it's just very difficult to like take a, 
something that's constructive, intelligent, and correct, and then figure out, okay, you basically want me to sew a patch of some kind onto this suit that's in a different material. And then what happens, I would bet you this is what happens. After two days, the team has integrated that sort of thought into their in, into, into their own thinking and the concept and comes back and changes the fabric of the whole suit, even though it's the same design and the thing works perfectly. But I think that that, that initial moment when you hear you know an account person say, something that sounds like it's something not part of the idea. It's just a very difficult moment to, to, to sit back, take a breath, and integrate that and realize that the account guy actually knows what they're talking about. You know yeah, what I mean? And, I'm, I'm, yeah. And account people need to be good at giving that. Uh, I think one of the challenges is creative people have been living with an idea for weeks, sometimes months. They've been developing it. They've been working with it, usually in a small team, maybe with a creative director or, or a more senior creative team. You've had so much time to be with that child that you're creating. And then you spring it on an account person or a strategic planner or a client even. And when you spring it on that person, they're usually a little caught off guard. And sometimes being caught off guard is great because you think, holy shit, that's a way better solution than I ever thought we'd come up with. I love what you guys did with spinning my original request. But a lot of the time, it's a, uh, oh, wow, that's not going to work. And right. what you want to do is to figure out how quickly you can change that's not going to work into maybe this particular thing won't work, but you guys, this is a great idea. The only challenge is we're not doing X. So it's really important that we find a better way to do this one thing. And when you – I also don't like to say um, this would be great if only you did blank. I like to say the challenge with this concept for the client is going to be that we aren't doing a good enough job of right. you know, closing the sales loop or creating a call to action. I don't want to tell you what the call to action is. If I tell you what the call to action is, you're going to reject it. If I say the challenge is the call to action isn't strong enough, then I'm asking you to find the solution that brings a stronger call to action. Or yeah. if if we know from testing that identifying the brand early on is really important to the idea of linkage or memorability and the client feels very strongly about that finding, then let's try to find a way to do that before you show it to the client and have them reject it because – we can probably find a way to make this work. But I think it's really important for account people or strategic planners or even clients to give people the challenge and not to give them the solution. As agencies, yeah. we hate that. Yeah, I think that's brilliant. And I think actually creative directors as well. I think sometimes it's about a lot, identifying the problem and letting the team figure out the solution. And, and I think that too often in my career, account people have – I've worked with some really, really good ones and you sound like I would want to work with you. I'm ready – by the way, ready to work with you, whatever you want to work on. <laughs> I'm available. <laughs> um, but the idea of saying like, OK, this isn't answering that thing and I don't know how to, I don't know how we're going to do it, but that's your job. Here's, here's the ne – and I think that that also helps frame it for the creative as – uh, as a new part of the assignment rather than something from the old solution being killed. So it's basically like, okay, here's a new little mini brief for you to solve. Within this context, how can you make this do that thing? Because I think the problem, I know this early in my career was that I never thought of these setbacks as opportunities because it was usually saying, well, they're not going to buy this or that doesn't work versus that doesn't work because if it has this element added to it, it will. I think that's a really, really smart way to frame it. I think that's really great. Yeah, that's a great perspective that you've learned with experience. And and I think the challenge is when you're young, you just hate the idea of somebody trying to mod, you know, moderate or modulate your idea. And I think as you get older, especially if you have that confidence, it's easier to see that okay, they didn't kill it. <laughs> There's this is still alive. There's a way we can make this work. Um let's see if we can keep the concept where we want it and still address that concern. And, you know, that's about craft and talent and focus too. So, it's, you know, it, you don't throw out the baby with the bathwater. Um, yeah. So sw um, switching gears, um, how do you define success um, for yourself, for the agency? Um, do you feel successful? Do you feel like the agency has been successful? Um, for me, I think success is a number of different things, but as the, person who's most responsible for whether or not we are financially solvent and have the tools for 
um, doing our business. For me, the easy one is, are we making money and are we winning business and growing or are we losing money and uh, shrinking? And I think that's a very easy, simple way. But for me, I think there's a lot more soft tangibles or, or intangibles that are much more intrinsically important to me as, as to whether or not I'm being successful. I, I am a person who uh, – it's funny. I, I listened to your discussion with, Dan, um, with Jeff Goodby and I thought that it was really interesting that he said he takes a different route to work so that yeah. he sees different experiences. And I live in LA, so you take the shortest route you possibly can. I don't – I don't take a lot of variation unless that way is going to be quicker. But I walk a different route every time I go to a meeting in this building because I want to see what's mm. going on. I want to see people in different departments and different floors. I like to leave a little early so I have time to talk to people in the hallways because you get insulated and isolated the bigger the company gets. You get away from that day-to-day -day and you sort of lose track of what's working and what's not working. And I think that for me, when I see people – busy and happy and um, collaborating and just like people talking in the hallways and sitting in little cubbies and things like that instead of a bunch of people with their heads down in a conference room looking depressed, then things are going well. Uh, yeah. when have, you, have you always had sort of this desire to take a morale thermometer temperature of a space? Is that something that's come naturally to you? Uh, I think it is. I think I'm a people person in general and I really – I've always said you'll find people in work who will say, well, you know, it's business. It's not a popularity contest and I totally I, – I, can't, I can't say totally disagree with that but I mostly disagree with it because I think business isn't a popularity contest but if people want to work with you, they will do so much more for you than if they don't want to work for you. A boss who yells at you – might motivate you here and there, but a boss that you believe in and a boss that you think is looking out for you and steering the ship in the right direction is someone who you believe in and you want to work for. And, and the same thing can go – it's not just bosses. If you have a project manager that comes to you and says, you have to do these six things before you leave tonight, your first instinct is to say – Right. Do they really all need to be done tonight? Is there no prioritization? This one's more important. I've got to work on this. Like you're, you want to push back on that. But if a project manager comes to you and says, we have a lot to do today. I, I know you're aware of what those things are. How can I help you? Is there anything I can take off your plate? Mm -hmm. Is there anything I can do to make this easier for you? You will do everything you can to help them. Just like great. when you, when you go to the creative director, or when you go to the technology director who's supposed to build the website, if you go to the guy who's building the website and say, we have this real problem. The client has moved up the launch date and we're trying to figure out how we can launch three weeks early with only 10 weeks to go in the schedule. He's going to sit down with you and try and figure out a way to solve that problem. But if you go to him and say, we moved up the launch date three weeks, you guys got to figure it out. Right. He's going to push back. And he's going to be negative and he's going to pass on that negativity to the rest of the team. So for me, I think a lot of that is just – it's not that I want to be popular. I want people to be happy about the work I'm asking them to do. I want them to be invested in it, not feel like they have to do this because that's the condition of employment. I think that's great. I think it also goes back to what you said earlier about earning respect and feeling like we're all in this together, which I think is super, super, super important. Um, Next question. Over your career, have you managed to have a decent work-life balance? Talk a little bit about um, about that. <laughs> well, yeah. I think it's been a, def a, a decent work-life balance. My wife might argue with you uh, or, or <laughs> might argue with me on that. Um, work-life balance is a really interesting thing. I was always, when I was young, a little bit of a – overworker. I like to put in the time. I like to read everything. I was so hungry to learn new things that I probably spent many more hours than I needed to at work. As I've gotten older, I think a lot of those time responsibilities are things that have become outside of my control. They're the demands of a new business pitch or a big project coming up with a client or the end of the fiscal year or a speaking engagement that you have to prepare for. But I think what has changed in the way that we look at work-life work balance is we used to look at work-life balance as were you able to get out of the office at night? Were you able to you know, not have to work all weekend? And I think that 
what's happened for me is that work and life are a lot more integrated than they used to be. It's not so much a balance as much as I've gotten comfortable with the idea that somebody's going to send me something on Saturday morning and need an answer by Saturday afternoon. But I've also gotten comfortable with the fact that I can leave on Tuesday afternoon at two o'clock if I've got something to do with my family. And mm -hmm. I think as we expect people to work more and more hours, we also need to find ways to have less expectation that they're sitting at their desk from nine to five and that they work in the same traditional way that that I used to work when I first started in this in this business. We expect people to work all kinds of crazy times and hours. But I, I think that if we're going to have that expectation, then we also have to have the expectation of creating more flexibility in their lives so that if you live in LA and you have a two-hour commute in the morning, maybe it's not the best use of your time to be at your desk at 9 a.m. Maybe right. if you were at your desk at 10.30, you would actually have a full hour of your day more to put toward either your life or your work. So I should be flexible with that and find a way to make the work-life balance work for your life and for your work. And I, th I think that's hopefully, uh, hopefully true for me, but it's true for others too. I do remind my wife when, when she will criticize me for working on, you know, a late night or a Sunday or, or reading a contract when we're on vacation in Italy, that the reality is there's some great flexibility that comes to me and I need to have some flexibility back the other way. And I, and I think we've come to a, a comfortable place on that. You just have to sort of look at it and say work-life balance isn't the same as it used to be. But it's still there. Very, very interesting. All right, last two questions. What, um, what personal trait of yours, what is it about you, about Pete, that um, has served you well so far in your career? Um, I think – Probably, I, hopefully it goes back to those two things that I asked for in creative people and, and that I ask for in everybody that we hire, um, curiosity and collaboration. I am a person – people always say, oh, well, you are a car guy because I worked on Toyota and then I worked on Honda. And I think, well, I'm not a car guy. I'm just a guy who likes big budgets because big budgets <laughs> let you do cool things. And then I was uh, – a technology person before the industry moved to technology. So they said, well, you're a, you're a techie geek. So that's why you got into digital so early. And I think, I don't think I was a car guy. I don't think I was a technology geek, although I, I am a technology geek. I think what I am is curious. I'm a person who's not satisfied with the status quo. I'm the person who is always looking for a way to do it better instead of assuming that mastering the way we currently do it is the most successful approach. So Very cool. I, I think the old agency model, and we, we've talked about this in lots of different forms, but the agency model was so stagnant from the Mad Men days all the way up until the beginning of digital that we really rewarded people for mastering what they already knew. And mm -hmm. we didn't build enough people, especially outside of the creative department, whose philosophy and whose operating principle was – I want to keep innovating and I want to keep changing. And one of the things that served me so well in my career was having to build the digital division and building a digital business model for an agency when it didn't exist meant that we had to keep trying things. We had to keep being open to new models and new ways of doing things. And when I came back to oversee the, the greater agency as the chief operating officer, that sense of just because that's the way we've always done it doesn't mean it's the best way for the future has stayed with me. And I think one of the really important things in managing change is people that don't like to change mostly don't like to change because they're uncomfortable with what might be. But they also right. don't like to change because they feel like by asking you to change, I'm asking or I'm in some way criticizing or vilifying what you've done in the past. And the reality is when we make change about being more prepared for the arena that we'll be in next year, instead of you're doing it wrong, that's why we need to change, it's much more comfortable for people. You know, the, the business that we're in today is not the business we were in when this old model was established. So let's think about if we were starting out today, is that the way we'd route copy? If we were starting mm. out today, is that the way we would form a team? So I think – by doing it that way, it makes people a little bit more invested in 
thinking about the future as how can we do it better instead of really looking at the past and criticizing it. Very interesting. You can't see me nodding, but I'm nodding like 3,000 miles away. I'm nodding my head. That's really cool. Um, yeah, it's cool. So knowing what you know now, speaking of the past, if you could go back to uh, spring of 1986 at UCLA, what would you whisper in young Pete and Wally's ear? What would you say to yourself knowing what you know now? I think the number one thing that I tell every young person who gets into this business is uh, to be patient. Um, and that's hard to say because when you have six months experience, you believe that you're ready for the next step. And it doesn't matter what piece of the agency business you're in. You're always trying to grow and achieve and attain and get the recognition and reward that comes with promotion. And I mm -hmm. think that one of the things that I've seen in the advertising business more than any place else is – you just sort of have to be in the right place at the right time and you have to be the person that's earned it. Uh, so there's lots of times when you have some rock star and you don't have a place to promote them to. It doesn't mean you're not trying to. It doesn't mean you don't want to. Um, but I think sometimes being in the right place at the right time is hugely important. And over the course of your career, things will definitely move. If you're doing well and you're progressing, they'll move. But every now and then you'll be stuck in a spot that feels like you've been there too long. Uh, and I think the tendency in, in this industry is for people to pull up stakes and move to another agency when those opportunities come up. But uh, I do think that one of the things that keeps people at RPA is that sense that we'll find a way to keep growing your career. If you're if you're talented and you work well with other people, hopefully we're going to find a way to keep you happy and keep you motivated and keep you working in a way that you can see your career path. And I think by the same token, as managers, we need to do a much better job than we traditionally have done in this industry of recognizing that young people want to be mentored. They want to be led. They want to be taught. They want to keep growing. And they need champions. They need people who are looking out for them. Uh, and I think it's more true about women in this industry than it is about men. We need to champion the young women who are getting this the, the job done. It's funny. I was looking. You mentioned the people that went to uh, Creative Circuit. And I think Alicia Dodder is, is a star working for us. She's one of the women who is a leader in our creative department. And there aren't enough of them. And I am – Really curious to see the people going into and out of creative uh, classes and creative educations because this industry is still struggling to find more women, especially to make it to the top. And I right. think that one of our challenges over time is to say, well, how do we – I know why there have been fewer in the past than there are today. If you look at it just generationally, my mom had different opportunities than my 25-year-old daughter has. And I think hmm. that if we just let generation after generation go, my wife and I met at Saatchi. She has a very different existence than my daughter and her friends who work in this industry have today. And I think that the next generation will be even better. But I also think there are things that we can do as leaders to say, how do we develop more women? Uh, how do we develop more women as leaders? Because we're really good in the agency business of bringing women in the door. We're really good at even promoting them up the ranks, but we're not very good at getting them to the top. And I think that's true of a lot of industries, but this industry happens to be one that's very progressive and very liberally minded. You would think that we would be far ahead of the field, not slightly ahead of the field in that way. I think that's really, really interesting. And you'd mentioned that sometimes you're ready for promotion and there's nowhere to put you. And the idea of, 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 of helping mentor young women is, is sort of a, an equation that has two sides to it. It's the, the junior and the young creative uh, taking responsibility for who they are at that moment and being patient. And it's also the responsibility of leadership at agencies to look and say, okay, there's a gap in leadership. Maybe that's this is a time to put this person in there. And, and I do think that it's not actively considered. And I also know that a lot of senior creative directors, ECDs, and, and – um, operations guys and, and um, client account guys, it's not like you're trained to to think about these things, especially creative directors that are promoted to ECD aren't necessarily trained to be mentors or leaders. And that's something that I think agencies need to do a better job of, of, of sort of systematically training their leaders to be leaders and not just senior creatives that now have that title. Well, Dan, that's a great point. I think it's one that we deal with in the industry all the time. And Joe, our chief creative officer, is always the first one to say it. 
you know, we, when we're talking about a business problem sometimes, he's very savvy with business. But at some point, he'll throw up his hands and he goes, hey, I went to art school. And right. the reality is we promoted him because he's an incredible designer and an exceptional um, conceptual thinker. We didn't promote him because he's the best person to manage the salary budget for 280 people. Right. And yep. we didn't promote him because he was the best person at writing reviews. And I think that um, the reality is Joe does happen to be pretty good at those things. But in general, we have promoted people because they were great conceptual thinkers. Right. In the account group and in the media department and probably strategic planning, the people who are the best at those roles tend to be better managers and leaders. But the best conceptual creative people are not necessarily managers. Right. And we, we should be training people better. We should be yeah. teaching um, management skills. We should be helping people train and not just leaving them to themselves. Because I think – and I also think it's very important generationally. People say terrible things about millennials all the time. But I have a couple millennials and we employ a ton of them. And I think this generation is incredibly motivated they are very, very interested in working for places that do things they believe in. They're much less interested in leaving your company for a 10 percent salary increase if they believe that your company is morally better and aligned with their sense of purpose. And I think those are things that we should value and reward in this generation. The, the I guess the – impatience and the feeling that I've already accomplished things maybe before we generally would in this industry is, you know, it's something that you balance out against some of those other great features. But millennials love to keep growing. They love experiences more than possessions. And I'm generalizing, of course, but in the research, millennials want to learn. They want to be taught. They want to be mentored much more than my generation did. And I think that's actually great for the industry. People Absolutely. that want to keep learning are better than people who think they know everything. Absolutely. That's well said. So we mentioned Alicia Dotter. I also want to mention Brett Westnedge, Aaron yep. Costello, uh, Nick Arangio, who's in Atlanta, and Matt Betts, who's in Boston, are all at RPA. They're circus alumni. And um, I miss all those guys. And I just wanted to mention their names on the, on the podcast because I think they're all awesome. So you got some really they, good ones. <laughs> so they are. Thank and you Alicia, so Alicia said to say hi. Oh, good. Cool. Well, I'll, I'll contact her later and tell her that we talked. So thank you so much for doing this. I really appreciate it. Yeah, anytime. I, I appreciate the opportunity. Thanks, Dan. And listeners, if you want to get a hold of Pete, you can reach him at pmwally at rpa.com. You can always reach me at Dan's podcast at mac.com. And make sure that you like the Facebook page, facebook.com slash DGMS podcast. And uh, until then, we'll s listeners, we'll see you in two weeks. Um, Pete, thank you again so much for doing this from long distance. I appreciate you setting aside the time. Great. I enjoyed it. Listeners, we'll see you in two weeks. Till then, see you later. Bye.